Welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, if you can uh, put the thumbs up or any sign on the chat, uh, that'll be good, just to make sure that you can all hear me. Lovely. Thank you. Um, we, we have uh, three uh, presentations, three papers on under the team low end contract, but they are mainly about a governance related idea, governance and uh, decision making uh, uh, related to uh, procurement related areas. It connects to a few other things um, uh, more quantitative in the first two. And the last one is a bit more qualitative. Um, I think we should start with the first presentation if uh, and we're still waiting for the second uh, uh, the presenters from the second paper and we'll indi individually introduce each and every one of them. So let's start with the first one without further delays. So the first paper is on uh, managing contract violations and construction projects, a moderated mediating model of enforcement decisions. Um, the presenters are here. Uh, as you know, now you know the drill, 10, per, 10 minutes uh, presentation, followed by five minutes of questions. We can extend a little further for this particular one because um, uh, we have an hour and we have only three presentations. Um, but let's, let's see how it goes. Um, so let's start with the first one. Let me enable that and see whether it goes well. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to share my uh, my co-author's paper with all of you. I'm Hong Jiang Yao, a PhD student at Tianjin University in China. My research topic is managing contract violations in construction projects, a moderated mediating model of enforcement decision. Here are the main contents of my presentation. I will introduce them one by one. Contracts are frequently violated in construction projects. And there are two types of enforcement uh, can be used to respond to contract violations. The first one is legal and contractual enforcement. And I mean applying the enforcement practices that are stipulated in the contract documents. And the relational enforcement, it means terminating future businesses with a violating party. Uh, in practice, uh, the, the violated party will first identify the causes of this violation. However, the high complexity of construction projects makes it difficult to find out the real causes. Uh, so the violated party may apply inappropriate enforcement practices, uh, which lead to disputes and the conflict uh, between construction project participants. Previous studies have dived into how to set up enforcement to prevent violations. Uh, only a few studies have explored the, the ap application of these enforcement mechanisms to handle contract violations. Uh, through uh, a literature review, we found that the current uh, research has focused primarily on the following factors that affect the enforcement. Um, contract characteristics um, based on transaction cost economics and transaction characteristics uh, based on TCE and relational factors based on social exchange theory and uh, network factors based on social capital theory and social network view. Um, we found that the following research gaps. Uh, the first one is the current studies typically treat the contract violations as a given scenario with no concern given to the role of the types of violations in enforcement practices. We follow Harmon 20, 2015 uh, to differentiate letter and spirit violations. Letter violations means violating the expectations documented clearly in the contract. Spirit violations means violating the expectations that are undocumented but tacitly held by parties such as solidarity and the informal obligation with the social metrics. The second research gap is the rule of macro factors such as formal institutional environments 
has not been studied yet. The third one is previous studies have mainly focused on contractual enforcement while ignoring the alternatives to it, that is relational enforcement. Uh, here uh, is the research question in our study. We uh, aim to uh, explore the factors affecting the violated party's enforcement decisions. Um, we argue the types of contract violations affect the violated party's trust in the violating party and in turn influence the severity of enforcement, both contractual enforcement and relational enforcement. Furthermore, and the above decision is impacted by legal support. Here is a conceptual framework. We argue later violations will lead to a more severe contractual enforcement and relational enforcement than spirit violations. And the trust mediates the, the relationship between violations and contractual enforcement and relational enforcement. And the legal enforceability strengthens the negative relationship between trust and contractual enforcement uh, while weakening the re uh, negative relationship between trust and the relational enforcement. Here the summary of our conceptual framework. We conducted a three-step pilot study. We interview two contract professionals to ensure the validity of our measurement. And we uh, interview eight project professionals to check the original questionnaire uh, to find out the issues of the questionnaire. And we pilot the questionnaire based on 33 projects. After that, we collect data uh, from the participants of six construction project programs in China. And the, our mainly project managers, lawyers, and business managers, and they had rich experience in contract management and dealing with contract violations. After that, uh, we collect uh, a total of 195 responses. Uh, here are the measurements in our study. We measure contract violations uh, based on the choice variable, that is, the expectation violated by the other party is expressly uh, stipulated in the contract documents or is not clearly defined in the contract documents. Um, all hypotheses are supported except the hypothesis 4B. This study highlights the previous understanding of the types of contract violations and we found that later violations lead to more severe enforcement. A second, this, this finding emphasizes the benefits of relational contract from a brand new perspective uh, because uh, a uh, spirit uh, expectations is just similar to relational contract because uh, uh, the construction project uh, participants uh, didn't uh, stipulate uh, the expectations clearly in the con uh, contract documents. Um, and uh, uh, spirit uh, violations lead to uh, less severe enforcement. Uh, it means a relational contract uh, can benefit the projects by reducing the severity of uh, contractual enforcement. And trust is one of the most significant factors that affect enforcement decisions. And this study reveals that legal support can strengthen the link between trust and the contractual enforcement. Uh, but uh, we didn't find the evidence that uh, about uh, the weakening role of legal enforceability in trust uh, relational enforcement link. We argue that uh, violations may cause the relationship to exper experience high perceived risks. In such case, trust becomes an absolutely dominant factor in determining relational enforcement and determining future business, regardless of uh, legal enforceability. And 
this study provides uh, some managerial implications. Um, inappropriate severe enforcement may incur retaliations, uh, retaliation uh, disputes and a conflict between parties and may destroy a profitable long-term relationship. And uh, this study remind the managers of the importance of contract documents uh, and uh, paying special attention to letter obligation. And this study implies a trade-off between more detailed uh, contracts to prevent violations or less detailed contracts to reduce the severity of enforcement uh, so to prevent disputes between parties. And this study emphasizes the significant impact of trust on enforcement decisions. Um, this study has some limitations. We only focus on form formal institutions, while informal institutions may exert a significant effect. We only collect data from China. Uh, future research can explore other enforcement decisions, uh, like stigma or loss of standing in the community. We uh, only collect, collect cross-sectional data. Here are the main reference of our study. That's all my presentations. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I'm the presenter. Anyone have question? Uh, sorry, Nicola, I can't hear you. It's my computer's program. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yes, now I can. Super, super, good. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Does anyone have any questions uh, with regards to this particular paper? I'll kick off with one. Um, some good response rates there, I can see. And um, could you tell me a little bit about the distribution of the surveys to the six project management training programmes? I was intrigued to know a little bit about the, the training programs that you had targeted as the audience for your your questions? Oh, yeah. Um, these uh, programs are aimed at uh, um, a project manager and the contract managers. And they uh, all have uh, experience, uh, rich experience in uh, managing contract. So they have uh, uh, rich uh, knowledge about uh, managing contract violations. Okay, good. I think um, Sarah's got a question here in the text box in terms of just for additional clarification. How did you measure trust or were you able to measure trust? How did you manage that? Oh, yeah, uh, we uh, adopted uh, the, the measurement of the previous studies about the trust. Uh, for example, we measure by uh, we uh, trust that the other party will be uh, will um, uh, be considerate of uh, us uh, when we are in trouble, uh, just like this. Uh, have I answered your question? You did. Yeah, that was a good question. For Hello, Sarah. everyone. Thank you. I'm very glad to share my... Oh. Um, do we have any further questions from any of the attendees? Uh, Nicola, I think there's a question in the yeah. chat box. Excellent. Um, um, just wondering, how did you identify the spirit violations in your paper? Separate. And what are the uh, violation behaviours in the training programmes you surveyed? So, what are the violation behaviours in the training programmes you surveyed? 
Okay, uh, the first question about uh, how I identified the spirit violations. Just like uh, uh, I said in the presentation, I uh, measure the, the types of violation by one choice uh, question. That is uh, the, the expectation of uh, uh, the expectation validated by the other party is expressly stipulated in the contract documents or is not clearly defined in contract documents. So uh, spirit violation means uh, the expectations violated is not clearly uh, stipulated in the contract documents. And uh, the second question, what are the violation behaviors in the training program to survey? Uh, violation uh, I'm not quite sure about your question. Uh, you mean violation behaviors, uh, such as uh, you use the fake uh, uh, materials uh, uh, that is uh, uh, strictly stipulated in the contract. Uh, it means you you violate uh, violated the letter uh, violation. Uh, or you use uh, another material, but uh, is not uh, clearly in the uh, defined in the contract documents. I mean, uh, if uh, the other one think you uh, valid the, the the contract, but is not uh, uh, very clear defined in the contract, uh, so it means you valid the uh, spirit expectations. Uh, uh, can you explain the second? I, I don't know. No, whether no, that's, I have... uh, yeah, Hong Zhang. I, I think that's that's uh, the answer is fine. Okay. I think um, um, I, I think what you have done in your work is that you have categorized them in your. You can see in your conceptual model, you categorize them into two groups, and uh, yes, and yes. Uh, so there are lots of behaviors, but you have put them into two different yes. groups. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think sure. probably that's the question. That question is asking you to explain a bit more about what those groups are and what is inside those groups okay <laughs> yeah um okay that's that's very interesting uh, am, I, am i correct in assuming that this is a, an opinion survey uh, and an opinion survey ended up in this uh, numbers that you got so you used one question to measure one variable and then you use that figure to make this uh, uh calculations is that is that is analysis is that correct uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, because I think the, I think the probably the uh, related to the last uh, the, the you know Jian Feng's question, and I think probably something to think about is that uh, maybe a, a group uh, of an idea, as you know, as you said, one of the behaviors or one of the group of behaviors is very difficult to be identified by a single variable. And yes. Maybe, maybe he is asking you to think about other variables. Yes, sure. Uh, our future research uh, is just consider this uh, possibility. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Any Thank other... you for your suggestion. No. Any any other questions? Okay. Okay. We will we'll come back. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's move to the second one. Thanks, Nicola. Sorry, it just uh, uh, suddenly uh, I, you know, I, I think I disabled my camera, and when I enabled, it just stopped me back coming back in. So I did, I did log out and log in. So thanks for taking over. No um, okay, so shall we move to the second presenter? Is the second presenter available now? Um, I'm not sure if there is a second presenter currently, okay. Nash. Uh, is anyone from the second paper available on, on, on here? Can you put your... Oh, yeah, he's here, I think. Yeah, he's here. Okay. Can you... So, Jing Qs, can you allow him to come in? So, how do we do that? <laughs> uh, I can meet into presenter. Okay. Brilliant. Excellent. Start us now. So, we'll move to the second one. Uh, so, he is in. Um, and we'll come to the questions again, 10 minutes presentation. At the end of the question, we'll come to you. Okay. 
I'll start the next one. Hi, I'm Mr. Tang from Tianjin University. Today I'm going to share my research on how to mitigate subcontractors' opportunistic behavior in the project. Opportunism is defined as the seeking of self causes disruption and conflict and is detrimental to the performance of projects. The construction industry has been hit hard by opportunistic behavior due to high complexity, uncertainty environment, and accessibility involved in the project. For example, the subcontractors may opportunistically threaten the general contractor with project delays to obtain price concessions or overbid the price of the new work in change orders. Prior study demonstrated that opportunistic behaviors of subcontractors can arouse project disputes, lead to delays in the project duration, reduce price quality, and induce high transaction costs, and also hurt the, the cooperation between the parties. Therefore, mitigating the opportunistic behaviors of subcontractors is one of the key success factors in construction projects. The managerial control is the critical governance mechanism for dealing with this opportunistic behavior. Um, it can be categorized as formal and informal one. The formal control can be exercised into two ways, including outcome control and behavior control. Outcome control explicitly states the intermediate and final output that subcontractors are expected to accomplish. For example, the general contractor provides evaluation criteria such as milestones, delivery timetables, and budgets by which subcontractors' accomplishments are judged. On the other hand, behavior control focuses on process of goal achievement in which rules, methods, and procedures that specify in detail. The general contractor will monitor subcontractor's behavior and provide reports based on the extent to which subcontractors adhere to the specified procedures. In construction projects, Regular meetings, walkthroughs, and weekly or monthly reports are some of the typical mechanisms to achieve behavioral control. Informal control involves clean control and self-control. Clean control refers to the control exercise through enforcement of commonly acceptable norms such as shared beliefs, values, and visions. In contrast, Self-control refers to self-imposed norms governing the work process. Even though the general contractor could encourage a subcontractor to adopt self-control that is mostly initiated and implemented by the subcontractor, therefore self-control is excluded in this study. The inconsistent conclusions nevertheless have emerged from the control literature. The extent literature has revealed some of the contingencies that may change the efficacy of managerial controls on the op opportunistic behaviors, which are presented in this table. Um, however, the, internet, the internal elements within the project organization are scarcely explored, such as the project organizational arrangement. Therefore, the current study aims to bridge the gap by uncovering the governance efficacy of managerial controls in different, uh, in different project organizational arrangements. Here we focus on subcontracting dispersion, which refers to the extent to which a general contractor distributes a subcontracted scope to subcontractors. A high level of subcontracting dispersion may cause complicated coordination and blur responsibility on the work interfaces, but also re relieve the reliance on a few subcontractors, all of which may exert potential influence on the way different, sub different managerial control modes may work. Accordingly, this research highlights 
the subcontracting dispersion as the lens to investigate how the organizational arrangement impacts the efficacy of different managerial control. Before we come to the research questions, how do different managerial control modes impact the opportunistic behavior of subcontractors? How does the organizational arrangement in subcontracting impact the efficacy of managerial control modes? Here we come to the research framework of this study. We got six hypotheses in total. The first three are the main effect, and the last three are about the moderation effect of the subcontract dispersion. This study uses a questionnaire survey to collect data. We use multi item scales to measure all variables except for those control variables. Convenience sampling method were used. A total of 366 questionnaires were obtained during the four months of data collection from project management training programs conducted in 2018. The final sample includes 323 valid questionnaires. This high rate of response was expected considering that the data were collected from a captive audience during training program for those construction project managers. Hierarchical regression analysis was conducted to test the hypothesis. The results show that hypothesis 1a and 1c are both supported, while hypothesis 1b is not supported. Besides, all the moderation hypotheses are supported. Simple slope tests were also conducted to get more information into the interaction effect of subcontracted dispersion. Move to further explore the information in our data set to explore the complicated relationship between managerial controls and opportunistic behavior. We also conducted an additional configuration analysis with the fuzzy set qualitative comparative analysis. Well, um, my presentation will end up with a brief summary of the findings. Subcontractors' opportunistic behavior will be curved by the outcome control and coin control. However, due to the difficulty of creating a shared goal and a shared belief, clean control is likely to be more difficult to achieve in construction projects. And next, the opportunism curbing effect of the outcome control will be strengthened in a high level of subcontractor dispersion. Then the negative relationship between clean control and subcontractors' behavior will be weakened with a high level of subcontractor dispersion, leading to a higher frequency of opportunistic behavior from the subcontractors. And also, the opportunism mitigating effects of behavioral control contingently rely on the level of subcontractor dispersion in the construction project. Um, that is mean uh, th th that is behavioral control will mitigate subcontractors' opportunistic behavior in the low level of subcontractor dispersion. While well, instead increasing subcontractors' opportunistic behavior when subcontractors are highly dispersed. And lastly, when the subcontractor dispersion is at a low level, the existence of behavioral control with the absence of clean control leads to a frequent opportunistic behaviors. While well, the coexistence co of Behavioral control and clean control lead to a very low frequency of opportunistic behaviors. Notwithstanding, behavioral control reduces opportunistic behavior in subcontracting arrangement with low subcontractor dispersion. The use of clean control is indispensable. And well, that is for this research. And thank you for listening. The questions and comments are more than welcome. Thank you.
Lovely. Thank you, Jinkiri. Is, is, that, is that correct? I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's almost. Yeah. <laughs> almost there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry, everyone, that I, I'm wrong. I'm late because I have no, technical okay. issue. <laughs> I cannot get access to, to, to from all my devices. And finally, I had to use my cell phone to, to access the meeting room. <laughs> so sorry about that. No, no, that's not a problem because you are on time for your presentation. That's that's fine. Uh, so thank yes. you for joining us. Um, <laughs> and it is a very interesting presentation. You're looking at opportunism and uh, uh, subcontracted uh, dispersion. And there are some very interesting findings at the mm -hmm. end. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a lot of jargons used in the, the last last uh, slide. Um, so if I'm talking about, for example, um, you know, subcontractors, what would be your advice if you want to reduce opportunities, opportunistic behavior? Uh, so, sorry? Uh, what would be your <laughs> advice if you want to, re if someone wants to reduce subcontractors' okay. opportunistic behavior? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're asking about the practical implication of the study. Yeah. Correct. Um, well, um, I think the basically advice is that if the if you hire or if you hire many subcontractors in the project, you'd better let them do their work by by themselves. You you try not to intervene the intervene their work. Just let them co cooperate, collaborate by themselves. That would be better for for all, all the project. So this is when there's a, the higher number of subcontractors in yep. the project. Okay, okay. Um, because I, I think it, it, that's what you are actually coming with at the at the last light. Uh, I was I was looking for a, a punch line at the end. <laughs> so so that's why I asked you that question. But that's fine. Thank you. Um, okay, let's open uh, the floor for any questions. Uh, do I have any questions on the chat box? Uh -huh. You do, Naraj. There's two questions, one from oh, Sina and another one from Tara. Oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, so the first question uh, from Sarah, let me read this out. Uh, for your interesting and relevant presentation, thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, you are using convenient sampling methods. Why did you choose um, this sampling method and how does this influence your results and study uh, as a whole. Well, yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, it's it's indeed a very important one to the research design. Well, I think the most important reason that why I use uh, convenience sampling is that it's about the availability. Uh, we we cannot get access to the pro project database. We didn't have that kind of database, so. Uh, what I can do is to collect data when my advisor giving giving seminar, giving classes in the project management program. So that is how I get get access to the data. Yeah, I think it's indeed in, it may impact the 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 results. But uh, considering all the program training program are are from different different companies i think it's it still show some re representatives okay okay and i think probably i think attached to that is because these are coming from the training program you collected this data from a training program so it probably depends i think sarah is still typing uh, i think it also depends on who attended the training program do you oh, have yeah. a population do you know who attended the pro program yeah, we we choose those with um, at least three years working experience, and also they work on contract management, uh, also or, or uh, project management in the project. We choose those kind of professions as our target. Okay, so that's the role, roles that you have selected. Okay, yeah. so there may be other questions. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Uh, Sarah goes on to say, good to reflect on this indeed. I did not read your paper, sorry. Yeah, okay. So I think probably it is, uh, it is included in the paper. Uh, and I think that's probably what uh, Sarah is telling. Okay. Just, Naraj, just one yeah. final question from Tara. Um, just yeah. whether or not you had a, a comment on the power differential between uh, main contractors and subcontractors. So obviously the, the difference in the power between the two. Um, and do you think that the main contractors can act um, opportunistically given that their size and financial power, so that, that differential. Um, do you have any comment on that? Mm, well, yeah, it's yeah, it's indeed a very interesting question. I didn't think through yet. Mm, well, yeah, I, I didn't have a perfect answer right now. Maybe I just need more time to think over it. Okay. Okay, no okay. problem. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a valid it's a very important question as a whole because you know you are looking at subcontractors, um, but the part of the equation is that they are not alone; they are in a project with main contractors. So the the opportunistic behaviors go both ways, um, and sometimes uh, oh, you know different countries have different cultural issues, but mm -hmm. uh, at least in this country, uh, there's more. Uh, opportunistic behavior by the main contract we see a lot of them from the main contractor so yeah um, so that's worth thinking about that yeah yeah okay thank you for those advice okay uh thank you uh it's brilliant uh, i think those are the two main questions we got okay um that's brilliant is there is there any other questions if not okay thank you jim that's brilliant thank you very much um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I think let's uh, so let's move to the next presentation. I think I still hear. I, I saw her name on the. She is, I believe. Yeah, she she, she was. Is. Brilliant. Yeah, she's here. I think we had to just promote her to the uh, presentation. Uh, so let me start that one. Uh, can you put? Uh, can you move her to the uh, presenter panel? Is that possible? Yep, I'm just doing it now. Oh, brilliant. Just have brilliant. a look and just to see whether or not she's she's still there. Yeah. Let's see if we can start with Hopefully the person. Clarice with us. Okay. Yes. Clara, are you there? Uh, could you could you type your message just to? Oh yeah, she's it. Okay. Yep. So we'll start the presentation, and yeah, we'll start the presentation. Okay. So we move to the third presentation. Welcome to this presentation of Public Procurement of Engineering Services, Governance and Control Mechanism. My name is Clara Hennel and I'm a PhD student and I've written this paper together with my supervisor, Professor Tina Kalman Gustafsson and Professor Pat Eriks. Why study engineering services? In order for the public sector to be able to build roads and facilities, and the many services are of great importance. But the engineering services are completely complex. They use iterative and more standardized processes. They are being advisory and usually, usually public funding uh, tasks uh, delivered by experts. It's also going to be difficult for the client to, to specify and control these services. And we see that there is a lack of studies on procurement of engineering services. Therefore, the purpose of this paper uh, is to investigate the choice of governance and control mechanisms in engineering contracts uh, from two perspectives, the public clients and the service providers. In this theoretical framework, we have chosen to combine the governance mechanism by Williamson with the control mechanism 
by Uchi. And this has previously been done in, in other studies. Governance mechanisms tell how to coordinate the relationship between the client and the service provider, whereas the control mechanisms tell how to obtain the control of the relationship. The three uh, governance mechanisms, price, authority, and trust, are usually combined with the three control mechanisms, output control, process control, and social control. In this table, you can see uh, the usual combination of these six aspects. We have chosen to focus on specification, reward system, and performance evaluation. You can see in this table which type of specification, reward system, and performance evaluation that is usually tied to these three combinations. We carried out 14 interviews with managers from the Swedish Transport Administration and different engineering consulting companies. All the interviews were transcribed and coded according to the theoretical framework. We used the theoretical thematic analysis and the semantic approach. And the empirical context is the procurement of fiscal planning and design. And you can see the project process um, at the SDA in this figure uh, below. We have focused on the light gray parts. So to the discussion. In order to, to specify and control using output or process control, the client needs to have information and in-depth technical knowledge of the things procured. Therefore, when procuring complex engineering services, the clients are usually forced to rely on the service provider using social control. Clients are usually and the service providers. In the facilities, engineering services are of great importance. But engineering services are considered complex. They use uh, iterative and non-standardized processes. They're being advisory and usually, usually problem-solving uh, tasks uh, delivered by experts. It's also considered difficult for the client to, to specify and control these services. And we see that there is a lack of studies on procurement of engineering services. Therefore, the purpose of this paper uh, is to investigate the choice of governance and control mechanisms in engineering contracts uh, from two perspectives, the public clients and the service providers. In this theoretical framework, we have chosen to combine the governance mechanism by Williamson with the control mechanism by Uchi. And this has previously been done in, in other studies. Governance mechanisms tell how to coordinate the relationship between the client and the service provider, whereas the control mechanisms tell how to obtain the control of the relationship. The three uh, governance mechanisms price, authority, and trust are usually combined with the three control mechanisms, output control, process control, and social control. In this table, you can see uh, the usual combination of these six aspects. We have chosen to focus on specification, reward system, and performance evaluation. You can see in this table, which type of specification reward system and performance evaluation that is usually tied to these three combinations. We carried out 14 interviews with managers from the Swedish Transport Administration and different engineering consulting companies. All the interviews were transcribed and coded according to the theoretical framework. We use the theoretical thematic analysis and the semantic approach. And the 
empirical context is the procurement of physical planning and design. And you can see the project process um, at the SDA in this figure uh, below. We have focused on the light gray parts. So to the discussion. In order to, to specify and control using output or process control, the client needs to have information and in-depth technical knowledge of the things procured. Therefore, when procuring complex engineering services, the clients are usually forced to rely on the service provider using social control. However, in this study, we, we had a client that has an information advantage, at least initially in the beginning of the contract, and also in the technical knowledge of what they are procuring. Therefore, they are experiencing lower levels of uncertainty and complexity. And they are therefore able to choose between all three governance and control mechanisms. And we see this governance and control mechanisms metaphorically as tool in a toolbox. And the toolbox is visualized by, by the frame in the upper right. Previous studies have, have talked about the importance of um, transaction characteristics and forming the strategy according to those. But we can also see that the, the ability of the client is important then in, in terms of the information they have, the in-depth technical knowledge, as well as the um, ability to formulate clear specifications in order to, to reduce the uncertainty for the bidders. So a client that has in-depth technical knowledge of the task, they tend to prefer to use detailed process control in the evaluation of the performance, which is in accordance to, to previous studies. And that's because these tend to have difficulties not to, to control if they know, if they seem to, to think they know, know better uh, than the service provider. But we can also see that the clients seem to strive for more formal control in terms of output and process control rather than informal control in terms of uh, social control when specifying and rewarding. They seem to be specifying in great detail and they also seem to prefer fixed price over more time and materials and in, uh, incentive uh, rewarding system. So it's difficult for for a client not to prepare the project and the contract documents too much because they, they want to decrease the, the uncertainty and the complexity to increase the output measurability. They seem to, to want to procure something more simplified. They also speak in terms of products. This exemplifies the engineering services as commodities. And interest drive to, to write more detailed contract documents and also gathering more information. They will face a challenge of specification because still it is a complex engineering service that they are specifying. And there will be gaps and there will be different possible interpretations in these specifications. Therefore, trust seems to be an important factor to manage these gaps. So the conclusions are that there are situations when a client has information advantage and in the technical knowledge of the text, tasks they procure that will affect how they choose governance and control mechanisms and also how they select and deselect among these uh, mechanisms and tools. So not only the transactions 
characteristics are important in, in this choice, but also what information the client has, the, the in-depth technical knowledge, and the ability to formulate clear specifications. So a client having in-depth technical knowledge of the tasks tend to strive for more formal than informal control. And in order to, to manage the potential different interpretations, trust is very important in these relationships. So do you have any questions? Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, class here. Yeah. Okay, uh, is there any questions? Let me open the floor for any questions. Uh, brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Um, there's no questions in the chat box as of yet, Naraj. Oh, there's one landed now. Oh, there's one just come in. Okay, it's a, it's a long one from Jin Q. Um, let me read that one. A very important topic, but I'm a little confused. In the hierarchy, the employee have to do what the manager told them to do, uh, which does not mean the manager always instructs the uh, and monitors the process and procedures of work. Authorities could also end up in the goals and targets the employees have to accomplish which is in line with output control. Could you elaborate a little bit why the, there is a strong linkage between authority and process control? I think that's a straightforward question. Or put it in another way, why authority cannot be applied by output control? Yeah. Um... Authorities is more linked to um, clearly specifying and, and clearly um, kind of determining uh, the process of the of the other party. Uh, so in this sense, it's not um, it's an um, uh, inter uh, relationship uh, where the public client is uh, performing control over a a private uh, engineering service uh, company. And this is according to to, pr to previous studies that um, authority and, and process control are, uh, are linked um, since that is kind of the, the standard way of, of monitoring um, a relationship. Um, for, for output control, it's usually uh, used uh, uh, together with the uh, market governance, um, where we use more functional uh, specifications and uh, let the, the the market carry out the work. Um, so I don't really know how to to answer uh, that in a better way. That's okay. It's okay. Um... I'm just uh, okay. um, Jin Q. Does it give uh, does the answer give you? Um, uh, is does it lead you anywhere? Is there a further discussion, further question you want to ask? Okay. I'll, I'll, if the next question comes, and I'll, I'll I'll forward that. Uh, I think it's probably needs further discussion between you two. I think. She's also doing something in a very similar area, probably the similar terminologies. Yep. However, the, we may use the term, but we may mean something slightly different. So I think there's a bit of a discussion there to have. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this, okay, Jim is typing, so I will wait for that. Uh, so there's another question from uh, Jan Feng. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, in general, do you find it easy for the client to clarify the specification to have better control? and specific cases in your interviews, any specific cases in your interviews, what might be the suggestions for the client of engineering services? Well, um, 
for the for these type of services, it's rather difficult to specify. Uh, even though the clients um, seem to think they they know how to specify it, it still uh, is is very uncertain and very complex services that they are specifying. Um, so, yeah, it, it's they try their best because they. Uh, since they know the details, since they are technical specialists, they, they really want to specify in detail. Uh, however, it's, it doesn't really um, end up um, uh, that successful. Uh, and that's why trust is, a, is very important to kind of um, overcome um, these gaps uh, and their uncertainties um, during the contract contract. Um, length of of contract okay okay so are you suggesting that uh, you know there are more nuances uh, more uh, discussions to have about the relationship between specific specifying things and then the controls that people have it's not um, a straightforward uh, relationship uh, where better specification leads to a better control uh, exactly um and uh, especially since I, I think when you procure something um rather simple uh, you are able to to foresee everything uh beforehand and are able to specify um rather details and also able to to get exactly what you have specified um but when you when you buy a service that is uh, very complex and uncertain um it's it's more difficult. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, that's good. So I, I think certainly I think um, uh, the today's presentation I think you you all have a sort of a very similar sort of a governance related uh, area of research. It's, it's it's good to link up with other authors and you know explore further things. Um, and of course, you are coming from different uh, countries as well, and the the, the the population of research coming from different places. So. Maybe it's something to explore, you know, with that as well. So there's more to more to discuss between you you all. Um, I think that's. Uh, is there any other question? I think those are the two. Thanks, Jen Fang. Thanks, uh, Jin Q. Any questions? Any other questions? Please. I think that's all for the questions, Naraj. Okay, that's brilliant. I think we are on time. Just a minute to go. So that's brilliant. Thank you very much for all the presenters and a good. Thank you very much. Cheers.